You've heard the saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And it expresses the sentiment that we humans get set in our ways. And once we do that, there is little that can be done to change our ways. And, and there is some truth to that. My dad, for example, has never owned a computer, has never wanted a computer, has never used, to my knowledge, a computer, and I'm pretty sure at this point in his life, I don't think he ever will. But I find that kind of fascinating because I remember when he bought the revolutionary technology known as the car phone. Do you remember the car phone? <laughs> For those kids out here, a car phone is a phone that was attached by a cord to your car. You couldn't take it away from your car and you had a little antenna on the roof. Put up your hand if you had a car phone. <laughs> But somewhere along the way, new technologies became a young person's game for my dad. And he got left behind in the age of computers and the internet and smartphones, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, that is just with technology. When it comes to tools, though, my dad had a different approach. As he got older, he adopted the attitude, work smarter, not harder, right? And so he uh, would find all sorts of new tools and new tricks of the trade that would make his job as a general contractor a lot easier. Most recently in his retirement, if you can call what he does each day retirement, um, he purchased a cherry picker to lift him up so that he could work on roofs and in other high and hard to reach places. And he told me, Reuben, this is gonna save 10 years on my legs. And so yes, there are some things in our lives that seem cemented and unchangeable, and yet human beings have an incredible capacity to change even those who think of themselves as old dogs. The truth is, I don't think your ability to change has very much, if at anything, to do with your age. Because I actually find that, uh, that some young people can be quite resistant to change as well. Ask any parent who's tried to uh, get their child to change what they are wearing to go to church. Or getting them to change their mind about asparagus or about wearing a jacket when it's minus 15 out. Resistance to change is what I'm saying is not really an age thing. It's commonly said that no one particularly likes change. As the old joke goes, the only one who likes change is a baby in a wet diaper. But that, of course, is not exactly true either, although babies want changing their diaper, that, that's true. But I think many people long for change. Those who are suffering long for change. Those who are sick long for change. Those who are on the margins of society, those who are oppressed long for change. Indigenous people in Canada long for change. The 2S LGBTQI plus community longs for change. Women in domestic abuse situations long for change. The homeless and those in poverty long for change. Our very planet groans right now for a change in the ways that we exploit and pollute our environment. And, and I believe we all, all of us, have a longing for some kind of change in our lives, whether that's the, the mending of a broken relationship, the healing of past trauma, finding meaning and purpose. And so the question I want 
to ask you this morning is, what change do you long for? What change do you hope for? The problem that most of us have with change is not that we don't want it, but we don't believe it's possible. We live by those old adages, old dogs can't learn new tricks, that we are set in our ways, that the die is cast, that traditions are set in stone, or to use the metaphor from our scripture today, that the clay pot has been spoiled, wrecked, and there's nothing that we can do to change that. The people of Israel didn't think that change could happen. God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah to them in a time of great turbulence for the people of Israel, a time when they were under siege by the the Babylonian army, And that ended, that siege ended with the destruction of the city and the destruction of the temple and the exile of God's people to Babylon. You can imagine that hope for a change in their situation was unlikely. So God tells Jeremiah to remind God's people that even when things are bleak, even in the worst times, God can make a change. And Jeremiah tells the people of the vision that he has at the potter's house. Jeremiah 18, 46. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Listen to those words again. Can I not do with you just as this potter has done? Just like clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand. How are those Plato creations coming, guys? You are the potter this morning, and you've got that clay. Keep working and reworking it. And if it gets spoiled, don't give up. I want you to think about the change that you'd like to see in this world the change you'd like to see in the church, the change that you'd like to see in your own life. And I want you just to just reflect on those words. Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in God's hand. God is asking us today in this text, can I not do with you? just as the potter has done? That question is rhetorical, of course. Yes, God can make a change happen. And there are countless examples in Scripture uh, to show us this is true. God took Abraham and Sarah, an old married couple who had no kids and no hope of having kids, and he made them the parents of nations. And then there was, there was a young shepherd boy who nobody knew. And God made him into the greatest king of Israel. And God, in Jeremiah's situation, took a whole nation in exile and brought them back to their homeland to rebuild that which was lost. God can make change happen. God is willing to effect change in each of us. The only question is, are we willing to be changed? And now we come back right to where we started. We want change, but we are so often 
set in our ways to let God do something about it. We think it can't happen. When my kids were younger, they liked to play with Play-Doh. I see nothing's changed. But you know what happens? Uh, Parents know what happens. What happens when you leave Play-Doh out on the table and you don't put it away? It gets hard and brittle and you can no longer create with it. And you know, uh, you know what I would do with dried out Play-Doh? I'd trash it. <laughs> I had no patience for it. I hated it in the carpet and I'd have to like pick it out. I'd just get rid of it. Because it was useless to me. But then I learned just this week, (laughs) that you can revive Play-Doh. It takes a little bit of water and a little bit of time and a little bit of kneading, but that Play-Doh can live again. So here's the good news. God doesn't throw out the clay when it gets spoiled on the spinning wheel. God simply starts again. And when the clay gets dry and hardened and cracked, God doesn't give up on it. God refreshes it with the water of the Spirit, revives it with patience and grace, kneads it with compassion and God's strength until it can be made into something new again. And God, in the story of Jeremiah and the exiled Israelites, doesn't let Jeremiah give up on them as much as Jeremiah would like to just write them off. Instead, God tells Jeremiah, something new is going to happen. A change of heart is going to happen. A new covenant where the hearts of God's people would be softened. So that God's law of love and grace would be able to be written upon them. Jeremiah speaks for God again in chapter uh, 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. I don't know if you are ready for a change in your life. I don't know if we're ready here at Gale for change to come. I don't know what kind of change you're looking for. And I don't know, I certainly don't know how to change the big problems in our world. But I do know that God can change hearts. And that's where change begins. God can take spoiled clay and make it into something new again. And I believe that this this community of faith here is a place where that change can happen. You know, week after week, we come together for worship, we come together for community, we come together for acts of justice and service, and each time we gather, both in here and out in the community, God is changing us. The potter is at work. And you could say that in a way, the church, I'm talking about the people, not the building, the church is the potter's house. The community where God can take even the hardest clay, the hardest hearts, and turn them into something new. You know, the change that we'd like to see the change that that God would like to see 
it doesn't just happen overnight. If, if it takes Plato time to harden, surely the human heart takes longer. But by God's Spirit and in God's time and with God's gentle needing, we trust that God's promise will come true. The promise that we sang first thing this morning, Behold, behold, I make all things new, beginning with you and starting today. Amen.